Well, good morning. Uh, as you can see, we've come off a pretty festive week, and uh, we're going to enjoy that last part of VBS this morning as the kids will lead us when, we, when they sing in a moment, and we're going to encourage all of you to participate. That would be fun. So that was a great week, and, we're, and glad there were some friends here, new friends that we can uh, worship together and and uh, yeah, it was, it was a good week, and we have some thanks to give when we'll get to that point. Uh, a lot of folks made this happen, and it was a, just a really great week, so um, praise God for all of that. So, uh, Also, we will have some refreshments after, so please stick around, and uh, we're going to have some fellowship. So with that, with all the busyness of this week, let's take a moment and quiet our hearts, and then I'm going to read from Psalm 55. Hear these words from Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Our Heavenly Father greets you this morning, the God who cares for you more than you know, who loves you more than you know, who has done great things for you and for all of us. Greet you with his love and his mercy this morning. Amen. As he greets us, let's take a moment and greet each other. All right, all right, all right. So I, I'm going to encourage you to remain standing if you're so up for it because, you know, there's going to be moves involved here and all that kind of stuff. So we want to get the blood flowing a little bit. Can I have all the kids come forward? And can I have their leaders come forward? And anyone else who wants to participate that was part of EBS, you're welcome to come up here. And they're going to lead us in a couple of songs. So get your energy levels up. And Amy has her helmet. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see all of you. Good morning.
Give that a moment. Uh, Rianne, where are you? Where's Rianne? she hiding upstairs? No? Well, Rianne led all of this. Uh, where is she? Can I get her? She's not at Dave's. Dave's lying to me. <laughs> She's not here? Okay. Well, anyway, we want to give a warm thanks to Rianne and Dave for leading it up. So, thank you. And then there are lots and lots of people who are involved in it. So you've got the Dave and Dave crew who brought their drills and their tape measures and put all this stuff together. You had Amy and Marcy leading the kids in singing. There were countless teachers helping in different areas. And so it, went, it was really great to see a lot of the church get together and make this happen. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. It was really, really good. It was very impressive to see all of this, right? There's a lot of details and... From what I gathered from Marianne, she takes about two weeks off after this moment and then starts planning for the following year. So take a look at that turkey out there. That was kind of the big get of the season. It's a fake like 14 pounder out there and all the little props and all the things that went on the wall. So thank you. Thank you for that. So, so great. Thank you for making it happen. And it was a, it was a fun week. I'm sure some of us are a little bit tired, but that's all right. It went, it was good. It was good. So thank you. Just a couple announcements, so inside of your bulletin we have a insert there and I want to just bring your attention to a few things. Um, next week, uh, Esther Vernet will be turning 101, so we're going to have a little party after church um, for that, keep your eye open for that. Also, uh, there was a handout given out a couple weeks ago, we just called it the NERC Get Together. What we wanted to do is go where Amy's dad invited us to use his place. It's about three miles away. We're just going to get together, cook some hot dogs, have some fun, spend some time fellowshipping. There may be some dangerous games like bocce ball or something. And um, we'll just, we're just trying to have a time where the church can get together. All are welcome. If you want to bring something to pass, that would be wonderful. And uh, details, you want to talk to Amy about directions. I don't know the exact address, but I think it's on that handout. So if you want to keep your eye open for that, we're going to start at 5.30, and then we'll say to 8, but uh, Amy's dad said you can stay as late as you want. I just know with children and all that good stuff, you, uh, you have a cutoff, you can go home and get the kids to bed and all that good stuff. So that's coming. Uh, July 30th, we have a congregational forum. And then under ministry opportunities, there's a new uh, notice under there. So, and Rian, all her good work for Rianne, she, she realizes that she can't really continue as a flare director. So, uh, consistory, the youth committee is opening up that position. Anybody who is interested, please send a letter of interest to the church secretary, to Nick. So, I think those are the big announcements. Um, and there were, there's some totals for the baby bottle that came through, if you're interested in that as well. Um, Switching gears and going to prayer, uh, we had a pretty cool text, Ann and I, Ann Bile and I, from um, Julie Steffens. She was planning on having a surgery. Uh, she had some problems with her knee, and um, she had, sadly, the um, surgeons left a screw in her when they did the last surgery, and it was bothering right up against her muscles, and um, it was causing a lot of pain. But this week she texted us and she said she canceled all their upcoming surgery because it all has gone away. Um, so we've been praying for her. You know, it's been two plus years of struggles and hurts. So when we think about, we're going to talk about God caring for us. Uh, here is another example of him doing that right in our midst. So with that, let us go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we gather, that you have called us to worship. It's good to be together, and it's good to come into your presence. Thank you for all your mercy, for having people do all kinds of great work this week uh, during VBS, and for all the kids that came, thank you. I pray that they were blessed, and that all the, the seed of the gospel that was spread, that you would grow that up in their hearts, and they would come to know Jesus. As we said, you have loved us so much through your son, Father, that we just want to share that, and we got to share that this week. Thank you. 
Thank you for all those who put lots of work in. Uh, it was pretty extraordinary to see all the pieces coming together, and uh, thank you for blessing our work. We confess that we have not lived holy lives this week, and we have done things that have missed the mark. We ask for your forgiveness as we lay down all of our sins at the foot of the cross. And we ask to be renewed in the Spirit as we, as we come before you to hear your word and to sing more songs and to be blessed by you. Cleanse us. Help us to be white as snow. Help us to let go of the things that hold us back and to run to you because you really do care for us. More than we know, more than we can see. And maybe today, Father, through the Spirit, you can help us see straight up how much you care for us. Lord, we pray for those amongst us who are sick and ailing. Give them strength. Give them, give them strength to endure their illnesses. There's surgeries coming up for some folks. We pray that you would get them through that. We think of Sylvia getting ready for some more back surgery. We also thank you that you have worked in Julie's body and lessened her pain on her knee and, and in, her, in her leg. And we just thank you. Thank you for that. That's just a, a great deal of mercy for us and for them. Lord, we also pray as we come to the next part of the year and we get, we're living through summer and getting ready for the fall, Lord, give us strength as we have difficult discussions to deal with. Help us to be full of the Spirit as we think about these things and discern them. And Father, help us to leave all of our worries, all of our anxieties, all the things that are bothering us in on your into your hands and help us to live under the shadow of your of your wing to live in your presence thank you father for all your mercy and all your grace thank you for your son jesus our lord and for the spirit who lives in us we pray all of this in jesus name and all of god's people said amen, amen. it is now time for our offering can i have the deacons come forward Pretty fun week, eh? A lot of good work there. We've moved everything around, so even as of yesterday, my stool disappeared, so it's the way it goes. So we're going to finish 1 Peter. So if you want to open up your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. For those of you who are visiting with us, we've been going through a sermon series on the first, the letter, the first Peter letter, and uh, it's been quite a challenge because he's asking us to do things that we're uh, not used to doing, and th I think you'll find that the same way in this, in this last passage where he's concluding all his thoughts. He's writing to young Christians in a part of Asia Minor that he doesn't he probably knows, but he didn't actually do church work there, and so he's sending out a letter to them to help them in their struggles as they're being persecuted. So we're going to be in, starting in verse 6 uh, and reading all the way to the end and talk a little bit about the ending of letters too because oftentimes they're neglected and they're actually quite important for us. So with that, let us go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, with the help of Silas, or Silvanus, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you 
and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. This is the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. So it's tricky to figure out how we want to summarize this letter because he's telling us in sufferings to endure, to endure it. And he's telling us in a variety of ways that are contrary to the context that we live in. The American rugged individualism teaches us to pick up your bootstraps, figure it out yourself, you can do this. And Peter says just the opposite. He's saying submit over and over again. And he's saying endure it over and over and over again because you can bring grace to a situation that's ugly. And it's very contrary to what we're used to. So I was trying to think about how I would summarize this last part. I think what this is, is God's word to us through the apostle Peter. And as we learn through Silas, probably is the one who wrote it, is one of both struggle and one of glory. We've been given a new birth into this living hope but that new birth means dying to our old way of living, dying to our old passions and our old idols, and to let go of those things is no small feat. On the one hand, we have this incorruptible, unfading inheritance, but on the other hand, we don't bask into it until our, our corruptible, fading bodies die. On the one hand, we are an elect royal priesthood, a holy nation, and on the other hand, our position in life is lowly and humble. We are chosen, but we're exiles. We're not to be surprised by the fire ordeals that come, while the world is surprised that we don't join them in their sins. This is that struggle and glory that I think we see in 1 Peter. The way to this glory is not up, but down. And it's not through high achievement, but through humble submission to God, even in sufferings. And that message is contrary to the context that we live in. The way to glory is not through following our passions, but through doing God's will. And this tension between the glory that will be revealed in us in this present day sufferings, rather, it seems rather overwhelming. And I think this is why Peter concludes his letter the way he does. Therefore, be humbled under God's mighty hand by casting all your worries upon him. Why? Because God cares for us more than we know. It may not seem like he cares for us. We may not see it. We may not feel it. But this is what it means to live by faith. Do we trust God enough? Do we trust him at his word? So under God's mighty hand, we are following the way of Christ. Humiliation leads to exaltation. Death leads to life. And dying to our sins leads to living in the Spirit. So what does this mean, this God's mighty hand expression? Well, if you wanted to look it up, you would find lots of references to it, mainly in the Old Testament. This is where it first shows up in Exodus 3. The unwilling shepherd, Moses, is before the burning bush. And God says to him, I'm going to send you. And he says, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to go to Egypt. I left there. He says, the king of Egypt will not let my people go unless a mighty hand compels him. And then he says that over and over again. Later on in Deuteronomy 11, this is after the Exodus, after the golden calf, after a whole lot of problems. They renew the covenant in Deuteronomy, and Moses writes to his people, Remember today that your children were not the ones who saw and experienced the discipline of the Lord your God, his majesty, his mighty hand, his outstretched arm, the signs he performed and the things he did in the heart of Egypt, both to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his whole country. So this mighty hand expression has something to do with both God's deliverance and his discipline. It's a sign of God's mighty power. So you notice when I greet you or when I bless you, I use the right hand of power because that represents God's mighty hand through his under shepherd. 
The Apostle Peter is instructing his young flock in Asia Minor and us that letting God have his way with us is best. He will lift us up at the proper time. He will exalt us in our, our obedience. He will mold. These are the words he uses here. He will mold. He will transform. He will mend like a net, like a fishing net. <clears throat> he will affirm his people. And this is why Peter says, therefore be humbled under God's mighty hand. What's interesting about this word is it means something different than what we saw before. In verse 5, Peter says to the shepherds and the sheep of the church, clothe yourselves with humility. And when I read through this, I thought he's saying the same thing. He's saying be humble, right? But he's not. In verse 5, he's saying clothe yourselves, dress up in humility. Here he's saying be humbled. And the form means that God is the agent. Let him humble you under his mighty hand. Letting God have his way with you is best. And when believers humble themselves to the point of casting their cares upon him, they have reached the point where they trust God enough not to worry. How many of us worry? Ah, uh, I tried to do a little digging about the anxiety that Americans face and uh, it's quite large. We're, we're worried about our kids not getting A's. We're worried that they're not Olympians in their sports. We're worried that they don't get the best training and whatever. We're worried that so on and so on. Then we're worried about our finances. We're worried about the stain on the side of our house. We're worried that our car is just a little too old. We start worrying and there's anxiety everywhere. So what does it mean to cast our cares upon God since he cares for us? Well, casting means to throw or to propel. So would it be nice to take the anxieties you struggle with right now and throw them onto God? And the word cares is everything that we can think of, anxieties, worries, distresses. Peter's theological insight is rather profound here in these couple of sentences. Both control and worry are forms of unbelief. So why? Why is that? Well, let's talk about control first. To control your life is a sign of pride. If God is everything that he says he is, and we believe that, how can we run our lives better than him? But that's how we live, right? We live like, I want my life my way. And he's saying, I can, I can lead you. I've got this. I know what's best for you. How about worry? Worry is also a sign of pride because it lacks trust that God can actually care for you. He can help you. It doesn't mean it's always smooth or it always feels good. But he's saying, I can care for you. So we can only cast our cares on someone we trust. So then again, that question comes up, do we trust God enough to run our lives? Can we follow him and he will lead us in better ways? Now this gets into who God is. Is he this malicious dictator? Does he want us to suffer? Do you think it'd be really hard for God to trip us up? He would not have sent his son for us if he didn't care for us? How many of you are willing to give up your children for sinners? God gave his son for us. He would, let, he would not let us wallow in our sins. If we take a brief moment of reflection, we realize that God not just really cares for us, but he really, really, really cares for us. He wants to adorn us in white robes, which means we're cleansed. He gives us the Holy Spirit to live in us and guide us all the way. And think about how humble a humble life looks in these days, right? I, I like to use the NFL because you see this all the time. So you've got the team that really stinks. So sorry, Lions fans. I'm from Massachusetts, so you know what my team is, right? I, I was a Patriots fan when they really stunk, so I really enjoyed when they were really good. So <laughs> someday, maybe for Lions. What do Lions 
athletes say? What do the team, the players say? Well, I really trust in the coach and the system and these players, and we're going to have a good year. And do any of you believe that? You're like, no, they're going to stink again this year, right? Put a team that's winning, what do they say? I'm glad we were able to win. And that's a little example of the humble life. Doesn't it? You don't have to say much. You can say the other team is really good, even though it's the Lions. We played the Lions. I'm glad we beat them. I'm glad we got the win. They're a good team. You see how humility shows power. It shows confidence, but you don't, you're not bragging about it. Instead of throwing up these wishy-washy words of like, well, I really trust our system here and the coaches and the players and win. Go win, right? Now, what about God's timing? Because Peter says something here about he will exalt you in due time. What do we say about God's timing? Those of you who have been waiting for God to answer your prayer, what do you say? You have to wait and wait and wait, and you feel like he's torturing you, right? Here's what we can say about God's timing. It's different from ours, and it's always perfect. And that's what's amazing about lifting us up in due time. Peter ends with a few exhortations for us. Be of sober mind and of alert inner life. And think about Peter's life. He's at the Lord's Supper with Jesus. And this is what Jesus says to him in Luke 22. Simon, look out. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Now, lacking the humility, what does Peter say? He says, I'm ready to go with you, Lord, to prison and to death. And what's the answer to that? No, you are not, Peter. And most of us are not either. But with some humility, Peter should have said something like, what do I do, Lord? Help me through this, right? And he says, no, I'm, I'm going to go all the way. And then what happens? Jesus responds to him, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you deny me three times that you know me. And he denies that he knows Jesus to a lowly servant girl who can't do anything to him. Peter says we can resist the devil in and through Christ. And that is a wonderful tie to VBS, right? We have all the spiritual armor that we're talking about. So think about how God cares for you. I planned the sermon series in April. We moved VBS because we had a conflict with another congregation. And here in this last section, we have a week of putting on the spiritual armor of God. And here Peter is saying, resist the devil. He, he's like a roaring, a roaring lion, but he's like. He's not the roaring lion, right? Jesus is the roaring lion. And so in Christ and through Christ, we actually have the ability to stand. And one of the interesting things about the spiritual armor that Paul talks about in Ephesians 6 is, there's no armor on the back because there's no retreat. And this is why Paul says, when you've done all you can to stand, keep standing so that you can stand. Because in Christ, we can. We can resist him. And this is part of that glory and struggle. We have this enemy who wants us to sin, to not believe in Christ, and then we see these moments of power where he delivers us. Satan wants to tell us, take your worries upon yourself. You can handle it. God's busier doing other more important things than your little puny life. Go ahead, just run with it. And what does God say to us? I know every hair on your head. I knitted you in your mother's womb. I knew about you before the foundations of the world. That's a little bit different, isn't it? But we're always enticed by this idea that we can control our lives. Doesn't mean you can't make your own decisions. You want to go to Burger King? Go for it. But that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about control, right? We're talking about our eternal destinies, what is before us, and what does God want for us. Then this is also the glorious part in this final section. Whatever happens, God himself will make you and me complete. He will confirm, he will strengthen, he will establish us in the faith. And we don't understand it all. We don't exactly, can't say it works out in this nice, 
linear fashion. We don't get an email or a text about it. We actually have to live it. But somehow God carries us along. Somehow the Spirit leads us step by step into glory. Now, there's a couple of things that Peter ends with that I want to, after verse 11, so 12 to 14, I want to, I want to bring to your attention. It's interesting that Silas is here, and Peter says, I have basically used Silas to write this letter. Why, why would he do that? So Peter was the apostle to the Jewish Christians. Paul was the apostle to the Gentile Christians, right? Right? So this is what he says. He says, I'm using Silvanus to write this because I don't know how to write to these Asian Christians. I don't know how to express my thoughts to them. So Silvanus helps him write it. And what I think is amazing is that's an amazing amount of humility for Peter. He's an apostle, right? He needs the, the whole church, the body to help him. And so Silvanus writes, basically constructs the letter, probably dictating taking the dictations of Peter down and writing it. So that's number one. The number two, Peter says something about true grace at the end. I have written this by encouraging and testifying to you about the true grace of God. So what might the true grace be? I mean, isn't grace grace? Well, this gets back to that struggle and glory. What does it mean to live under God's mighty hand? Chapter 1, verse 10. Concerning this salvation... The prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you when they predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would come. Struggle and glory. And so Peter is asking us to do something that in our context is very uh, very unusual and radical. Embrace the sufferings. Accept them because God will use them for your glorification. This is way contrary to our self-indulgent culture. Peter is asking you, if you're a follower of Christ, to embrace the sufferings. You will be changed, molded, and God will bring you to the end. He ends with two things. She who is in Babylon greets you. What does that mean? Well, that I'll just save you all the details. He's writing from the church in Rome. Babylon is a biblical way of talking about a great evil power. And at the time that the church was started in Rome, Rome was really falling off the deep end as far as um, immoralities and other things. And so they were coming after the church. So you use code words, she who is in Babylon greets you. Okay. Then what about this greet one another with a kiss of love? How come we don't kiss each other in the church? <laughs> I knew that'd get a laugh out of somebody. In this context, to greet each other by kissing each other on the cheeks was a sign of honor and respect and maybe love, you know, brotherly love. If you've ever watched movies like, say, The Godfather, you would see the kiss the, the patriarch of the family, right? On, on each cheek as a sign of respect and probably a little bit of submission. But what does kissing mean for us in our context? Sexual, right? So we don't do that, right? Our context affect us, right? So Peter uses this, but Paul also uses it. He says, greet each other with a holy kiss. And if you start working at it and seeing when that expression is used, it's at every letter that there's the, the apostles are addressing trouble within the church. There's usually divisions. And so when Peter says love covers a multitude of sins or love one another or be of like mind, all those things that he says in this letter, he's trying to get them to be unified because they haven't been so unified. And so how might, he, what they're saying is what kind of physical affirmation can you give to show unity. So how might we do that in our context? Handshake or? So why do you think I'm a hugger? The neglected endings of the New Testament letters is why. How can we keep unity? We may disagree. 
a handshake or a hug, right? So we understand sufferings are part of following Jesus. We also understand now that after going through this, that enduring the suffering is like following in the footsteps of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We understand now that God uses these sufferings to chisel away our sinful natures so that we can put on the nature of Christ, which is a nature of humility and submission. And at the proper time, at just the right time, God will exalt us. He will lift us up. This is the struggle and the glory of living this life as a Christian, as a believer of Christ. And when Christ returns, it'll be all glory. We won't have to worry about it. But until that point, we have this tension of struggle and glory. The best thing we can do as Peter ends is to let God have his way with us because he really, really cares for you and me. More than we can see, more than we can feel, more than we can understand, he has said it in his word, which means it is true. Amen. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we conclude this word of yours from the Apostle Peter, and it's been really challenging. We thank you for it, but I have a lot of growing to do as I read through this letter. And as we begin 2 Peter next week, give us strength to live out your word. Help us to embrace the sufferings because we trust in you enough that you're going to use it for our glory and for your glory so that we can honor you and live a life that is pleasing to you. Thank you for a great week of VBS, and thank you for all the families that have been here, all the children. Bless them, protect them from the evil one. And Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I... So this week was full of change and different things going on in the church, and part of that was our plan for today. So um, as we sat in the Word and sat through music, this song was intended to go before the message, um, and it just seemed like it kept fitting even better after. So this is a brand new song. We want you to just uh, listen, uh, sing along if you'd want to. Uh, words will be on the screen, but um, just a chance to kind of reflect on the message that was just shared.
As we come through this journey of First Peter, this is how God told Moses to bless the Israelites. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Lord bless you.